Time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of sex. It's been an intense year and a half of revelations, accusations, and discussions about sexual assault. We've heard from women about their experiences, and we've heard from many experts. But what about men? Tonight, we'll hear from our regular male panelists about what they think and what may have changed. But first, some background. This week, the Gian Gomeshi trial came to an end, found not guilty of sexual assault and choking. It came down to the complainant's testimony. And in harsh language, the judge made it clear they were not credible witnesses. A key moment after a year and a half of conversations about sexual assault, harassment and consent. When the Gomeshi story broke, many women opened up about their own experiences. The voices came out and they've been multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. The hashtag, been raped, never reported, trended worldwide. Hey, baby. Hey, beautiful. Tales of catcalling went viral. Hey, hey, hey. Can I ask why you would want to do something like that? Intolerance for harassment amplified. Then... It is important for the world to know the truth about how Bill Cosby hunted me like a predator. 37 women came forward with allegations against America's favorite TV dad, prompting reaction from the president. Have sex with that person without consent? That's rape. With every controversy, every scandal, we've heard differing viewpoints from many women. What men think of it all hasn't been discussed much. So I'm joined by our panelists, our first ever all-male panel here. Jonathan Kay is editor-in-chief at Walrus Magazine. Stephen Marsh is a culture writer with Esquire. And Elamine Abdul Mahmoud is social media editor at BuzzFeed Canada. So welcome, guys. I know that there is not one male viewpoint on, on this, but I'm, we've heard you comment on so many things over the past few years. John, just the last year and a half of discussions, what's, what's been your reaction? Well, one of my reactions has been how differently men and women see a lot of issues. Um, in my conversations with women, in particular about the, the Gian Gomeshi issue, uh, often what starts for men is a highly compartmentalized issue. You know, what is consent? What is the standard of evidence? Um, things like that. Uh, often for the woman, during these conversations, will very quickly go to larger questions of vulnerability in society. So it's not just vulnerability in a sexual context, it's vulnerability in a professional context. Because there was an element of that with the Gomeshi story. Allegations of uh, work workplace harassment and that sort of thing. Um, so vulnerability in all aspects of society, even for powerful women. We saw in the, in the setup piece how you had uh, female sports journalists, uh, you know, privileged position, just like any other journalist, and yet in one moment they can be completely objectified in, in the crudest imaginable way. So it doesn't matter where you are in society, if you are a woman, uh, you are vulnerable in a way that, that a man is not. And that larger theme often just completely spilled out of conversations that, from my point of view, started off as compartmentalized conversations about the Gion Gomeshi case uh, and legal scenarios surrounding that. And then these conversations would ensue. And for me, it actually was eye-opening. I mean, there was an opportunity for dialogue that there wasn't before. Hmm. What about you, Leslie? Well, I mean, I think it's what John said is perfectly correct. But to me, it was just simply the bulk of the experience, like how common this was, which to me was not um, something that I really understood, I think. And frankly, I'm not sure I, I do understand it uh, still. I mean, I think what, there, what there's just been is how, how common these stories are and how, you know, almost every woman you talk to has some, you know, maybe not a, a real case of uh, rape, but a, a real case of some incredible moment of, as you say, vulnerability. And that to me was that, you know, that was not a part of experience that I was really conscious of. And I think, you know, it was eye-opening is, I, I mean, one word for it, but I think more it's also just confusing and also just how humbling, you know, how little I knew, how little I still know. And I think that, that moment of confusion, I don't know if it's, um, if it's very hopeful, but on the other hand, I feel like it's the beginning of a conversation anyway. That, that with just, just the sheer ignorance um, of men, I think is something that has startled them. Hmm. Well, I mean, you're of a younger generation. How, what, what was your takeaway watching all of this? I think from where I'm standing, uh, the confusion and the surprise is, is frankly, that is a surprise. Because women have been writing about this for, for decades now. They've been talking about a concept of rape culture and how that exists and how there is something about our culture and the way that we talk about women and the way that we talk about sexual assault um, that, is, that kind of leads us to conclude that 
men have been making these mistakes for a long time. And somehow this case has been the spark. I think a lot of people well, don't know why. Push back on that slightly sure. because, I mean, rape culture, um, I mean, that term, I think, has been popularized in common usage only for a couple of years. And I think it is definitely true that, that for decades we have been told about um, the power imbalance in society mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and feminism, that sort of thing. But I think for a lot of men, that was interpreted as a political message. And you learn right. about it in yeah. school, and it was contextualized as politics. But, right, and, but, but, but this, is, this, this is where the rubber hits the road, and it's like, wow, this is real. This is part of the lives of women we care about. I think rape culture as a concept has been around since the 70s. It's not as sure it's been more popular. It's sure it's gotten more press as uh, Bill Cosby's come forward, uh, the Bill Cosby case has come forward, the Gian Gumeshi case has come forward, but the concept has been around for decades. And we've been talking, like, women and feminists have been talking about this for decades. So I'm a little bit surprised. I agree, but it's, it's, as I say, it was primarily a political phenomenon, at least from my vantage point, I learned about it in law school and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the eye-opening <laughs> aspect of it was to talk to women you care about, and it's, it's not abstract. It's like, here's something that happened to me, here's something that happened That's to right. me. And that, that part is new because there's a new kind of candor. And also because the stories are being told in this very particular way. Like, it's not like there is rape culture in some general sense. It's mm. like, listen to these women talking about what Bill Cosby did to them. Mm -hmm. Listen to these women talk about Gian Gameshi. I mean, uh, listen to these... Who's been found not guilty. Who's been found not guilty. Clear, but yeah. listen to all... I mean, certainly that has opened the floodgates to a lot of stories that are... You know, rape culture is a very numinous idea that has been... It is a theoretical idea. Mm -hmm. and, and it has been talked about for a long time, but mostly in academia and mostly in, you know, select political circles. I want to move, move this on a little bit, just to maybe with you, Steve, and the, yeah. the idea of consent. I mean, are men thinking differently in terms of, like, are, are men... I hope they are. I mean, I, when I look around, I, I don't know if I have a lot of hope for men. Like, it seems to me that we are in a very dark place, in a very confused place, and also, um, you know, I like, I like to think that these issues are, are putting us forward and that they are making us think more clearly about things, and I think at large institutions they are. Uh, I, I think they are beginning to, but it's very early beginning. And, and I think the other thing is, like, you know, when you look at the actual dialogue among men, if you go on the internet, for instance, and see how men are talking about these things with each other, it is about as ugly as you can get. I mean, it really is pure misogyny. Is there misogyny. more talk now, do you think, or more? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, I, plus, a lot of it is just coming from courageous actions. I, again, the setup pack where you had the female journalist uh, interviewing somebody and someone made a vulgar comment uh, about her uh, and then she actually confronted the guy. That's just not something that would happen a few years ago and the same guys who would go on Twitter and Facebook and make vulgar comments uh, or even threatening comments, they see that sort of thing and even if they're not educated about it, they are at least uh, scared and they know the consequences that this kind of thing isn't tolerated anymore and I think that's new. I think it used to be a free fire zone, you could say whatever you want, create whatever kind of atmosphere and you can just laugh it off, and I think you can't anymore, and that's new. Is the, ch the conversation changing? I think the conversation is changing very slowly. I think women have been trying to drive this point for a long time, uh, particularly feminists who have been writing about this, have been saying that, look, the people who rape are not just bad guys hiding in the bushes. They're the people you know, they're the people that you love, uh, and consent is not this kind of fluid thing. Um, it's, it happens in a situation where a, where, where a woman goes, you know what, um, I'm going to say no in this in this situation, and then a man feels like they have to convince the woman. Um, that is an example of rape culture. That is an example of women having to contend. Is that still a thing? Of course for, it is. For men that they feel that no means maybe? Of course. Of course it is. Like, that's, those are the guys that we're talking about, right? Those are the men that we're talking about. And those are the women that, uh, the, like, the women are talking about this. Lauren Pelly wrote a wonderful piece in the Toronto Star talking about her experience um, in terms of saying, why didn't I say no? Or afterwards, why did I continue to say I love you? Why did I continue to be with that person for many, many months after that? Um, and it's talking about situations where she just didn't feel comfortable challenging the person. So how does this change the way men see themselves or the role of men, does it? Uh, I think it completely changes it because I think as the conversations become more candid, um, you start to have conversations with people you care about and you start to learn stories about maybe people in your family, uh, people who you've known for years. And when you hear those stories, that's different from just reading uh, stories about strangers in the media. Um, so the stigma, I think, has, has dropped from people sharing their stories. And I think for the vast majority of men, that has to have some effect on their behavior. I mean, I agree with that, but it's hard to see it actually coming to fruition. I mean, that's the thing that's so painful, is that, you know, when you look, I think you're absolutely right, and I think this is happening in a lot of individual men's lives, but then, 
you know, if you look, if you go to Twitter, right? Go to. Yeah, but go Twitter to, is the worst people in the world. I mean, no, but it's, it's true. It's like the, you Twitter, can't draw conclusions go to, from Twitter. Because go to Reddit then. Go to go to anywhere on the internet where it's men talking. Go to 4chan, and it's just ugliness, pure, pure vitriolic misogyny of a kind that you know is not getting better. Yeah, but I, 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 I reject the idea you can draw broad social conclusions from from the uh, public from the conversation Twitter. that well, is it's being because had. it's a self-selected group of people who, who don't feel their views are expressed in the mainstream media because in, in many cases because they're hate mongers and so they go on social media and you can't take that as a general representative sample. You know what, I think they're pushing back against this conversation and I see the vitriol on the internet all the time yeah. but to me that's interesting because they're engaging with the idea that they're supposed to be a different kind of man. Well, you know, um, to more that's broadly, that's that's tribal, a, it inspires tribalism too and it becomes a sort of gender war where you have people who take this as a uh, as a flashpoint, saying you see society hates men, but and that's what that, the conversation. But that doesn't about. tell you that doesn't that tell you that masculinity itself is changing. That these men are a little bit adrift. Like right? they're looking for they are a new place. A that's new what sign Gamergate. That's what Gamergate was about. Sure, yes, sure, and, I, and all of it, and the fappening, and all the rest. And of Gamergate it, like, was important for that reason because Gamergate, uh, it was kind of on display. It's like there's this element of male culture. That feels so but the defensive. thing that is amazing is that we don't have we don't have feminism. We don't have theorists of masculinity. Men don't. Right. Men don't. So what we have instead is this shouting match in which real ideas are just completely removed from the equation. Sure. And I think it means that I think it means that men are much more adrift in Except these conversations. Except the shouting match is being conducted by by the one percent of the, the stupidest men who are who are shouting yes. on our behalf. And that's why you know if you look at MRAs, sort of men's rights types, a lot of people will extrapolate from that and say, well, God, men must be idiots. But that's not the case. But we don't have Betty Friedan. You know, we no. don't have, we don't have, we don't, we don't have, have the... them yet. And I think like, what's interesting yeah. is that because masculinity itself seems to be very slowly collapsing, right? Like no one really knows what a man is supposed to look like in the 21st century. That's right. I think there are people who are kind of pushing back against the idea that um, they should be changing. I think you hear it all the time from men's rights activists, like the return of kings, right? Like, that's yes, like a website. Yeah. Like, there's a like nostalgia that like an older man... Like, Except it has nothing to do with nostalgia. It has nothing to do with how actual, the, how these, they imagine these old men used to be right sure like, gotta wrap up in just, this is so interesting but i just want one last thought from the three of you just because we do have to close in a sec here i mean i mean has this last year made how big a difference has this last year made i mean look uh feminists women have been laying the groundwork they've been building this runway for a long time i think all that this has done is kind of shown their work it's, it's they've, they've gotten more exposure um so they'll continue and hopefully that work will continue john uh, I think it's interesting to just spend a few minutes thinking about what life is like in somebody else's shoes and spending the whole day, not just in intimate situations, but professional situations, feeling vulnerable much of your life. So how big a deal has this past year been? I think it's one of those situations where we won't really be able to tell until we see what the consequences of this year. I mean, I think there are a lot of very important conversations happening right now, but it really remains to be seen what, what happens with them, whether they translate into political or legal change, particularly if the, if the way that sexual assault is prosecuted changes, then this year would have been very important. But in the moment, it's very hard to tell. Well, it's been fascinating to hear all of you. Thank you so much for taking part in this.